All right, I would like to um, welcome you all here today. And I'm trying to figure out how to mute everybody all at once. So um, give me just one moment while I get my act together. Uh, it looks like everybody has already muted themselves because they know what they're doing. Oh my gosh, I got it to work. It's amazing. Okay, we're good. We're good. This is going to be amazing now. Okay. Excellent. All right. Welcome. Um, this is session 152. I'm Heather Harris Bergevin, and I'm very excited to be your moderator for this session. Um, this is Tabernacles of Clay, Gender and Sexuality and Modern Mormonism, um, which is a book panel and response from author Taylor G. Petrie. And um, about the presentation itself, I should, I should show my copy, which I have enjoyed very greatly. Um, this panel brings together a diverse group of scholarly voices to react to the book Tabernacles of Clay, Gender and Sexuality in Modern Mormonism by Taylor G. Petrie. Drawing on a deep archival research, Petrie situates LDS doctrine in gender theory and American religious history since World War II. His challenging conclusion is that Mormonism is conflicted between ontologies of gender essentialism and gender fluidity, illustrating a broader tension in the history of sexuality in modern entity itself. As Petrie details, LDS leaders have embraced the idea of fixed identities representing a natural and divine order, but their teachings also acknowledge that sexual difference is persistently contingent and unstable, while queer theorists have built an ethics and politics based on celebrating such sexual fluidity. LDS leaders view it as a source of anxiety and a tool for the shaping of a heterosexual social order. Through public preaching and teaching, the deployment of psychological approaches to, quote, cure, unquote, homosexuality, and political activism against equal rights for women and same-sex marriage, Mormon leaders hoped to manage sexuality and faith for those who have strayed from heteronormativity. Um, I'm going to take just a second to introduce you to each of our speakers, and then um, I will introduce our first speaker for today. Um, Taylor Petrie is a professor of religion at Kalamazoo College. He was visiting associate professor of women's studies and sexuality and a research associate in the women's studies and religion program at Harvard Divinity School in 2016-17. He teaches biblical studies, gender studies, and theory and method in religion stu religious studies classes. He's the author of Resurrecting Parts, Early Christians on Desire, Reproduction, and Sexual Difference which is Rutledge 2016, and co-editor with Amy Hoyt of the Rutledge Handbook of Mormonism and Gender, which is Rutledge 2020. Alexandria Griffin is an incoming visiting assistant professor of African American religions at New College of Florida. She holds a PhD in religious studies from Arizona State University and an MA in women's studies in religion from Claremont Graduate University. Her first book project is on Patrick Francis Healy, a mixed race Jesuit who passed as white and became president of Georgetown University in the late 19th century. Patrick Mason holds the Leonard J. Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University, where he is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and History. He is the author or editor of several books, including, most recently, Mormonism and Violence, The Battles of Zion, which is Cambridge University Press in 2019. Jacqueline Foster is a historian of science and religion in American empire. She graduated with an MA in history from the University of Utah in 2020 and now resides in Missoula with her spouse and her daughter. Blair Osler is a philosopher specialized in queer studies and is a leading voice at the intersection of queer, Mormon, and transhumanist thought. She is a board member of the Mormon Transhumanist Association, the Christian Transhuman Transhumanist Association, and Sunstone. All right, now I'm going to give the floor to our presenters and we will be having a Q&A um, at the end of our time at about the 70 minute mark, I believe, maybe 75 minutes, um, depending on when we end up closing. And um, first is going to be Alex. So I am going to mute myself and unmute you. OK. 
Okay, one second. Just got to pull up my paper and not open a hundred other programs at the same time, of course. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I would like to thank Taylor Petrie for this tremendous work he has put forward for us to read and debate today. Um, today, I'm not interested in outlining its main arguments. There are reviews that do this really well. Um, instead, I want to use my time today to get into the weeds on a few elements of the book that are particularly intrigued and interesting. The key focus of this first chapter is interracial marriage as a kind of precursor to other threats to the perceived stability of marriage in LDS thought and discourse. How does this legacy of opposing interracial marriage alongside um, priesthood and temple restrictions continue through today? Um, although it may no longer be a mainstream feature of LDS thought, although insert caveats here, um, it has echoes in broader issues around the historic priesthood and temple restriction of people of African descent. How do we read the church's current partnership with the NAACP in light of this particular history? How do we read Will Collum, special counsel to the NAACP's president, asking in June for the church to do more to address its history with racism? What would that look like, taking into account not just the priesthood and temple restrictions, but the church's history regarding opposition to interracial marriage? I think one of Tabernacles of Clay's most interesting arguments is about the turn to social scientific or therapeutic language to justify a church opposition to homosexuality and eventually to same-sex marriage. Preacher Petrie, excuse me, <laughs> writes that in this process, quote, what had previously counted, am I still there? You are. I switched from screen share so that okay. you yourself would be shared instead. Sorry, I okay, was trying so to sorry. figure out how to do that and it, it was sorry, my audience. technical error. You're fine. Okay, Go right ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, to justify church opposition to homosexuality and eventually to same-sex marriage. So Petrie writes that in this process, what had previously been counted as, oh, quote, what had previously been counted as sins, including crime, intemperance, violence, and sexual delinquency, were transformed into illnesses with religio-psychological diagnoses and cures, end quote. Moreover, quote, these adaptations of therapy to theology share the modernist values of scientific progress, naturalism, and the reinterpretation of Christianity in light of historical and scientific knowledge, end quote. Um, so Petrie opposes this to arguments that the church did these things out of purely homophobic sentiment, writing that, quote, homophobia, itself a pathological diagnosis, goes only to explanation of changing church attitudes about same-sex intimacy, end quote, and that, quote, Mormon opposition to same-sex marriage has often been framed as motivated by a theology that places mixed-sex marriage at the center of salvation. This may be true, but it overlooks the stated reasons that Mormons have offered for their political motivations and the psychodevelopmental theories that underpin these theologies, end quote. At what point are we obligated to take Mormon arguments about same-sex marriage at face value, i.e. that they are about psychology and sociology, rather than delving into their obvious background context, um, so arguments about the sacrality of mixed-sex marriages and Mormon cosmology, as, as Petrie pointed out. Um, and this is an issue that spans far beyond Petrie's book and the study of Mormonism. It's one that's grappled with by religious studies scholars more broadly, and I would argue scholars in any field that tries to understand human action and motivation. So that's, that's a much broader issue. Petrie is attentive to one problem that is recurrent in the study of queer Mormons, the male focus. Um, so how do we acknowledge that homosexuality has been primarily imagined as a male problem um, in LDS discourse without erasing the experiences of women and people of other genders in our exploration of this construction? Um, so in thinking about this, I was reminded of a story told to me by D. Michael Quinn, um, that estimable and wonderful scholar, uh, when I asked him about his inclusion of women in his book, Same-Sex Dynamics Among 19th Century Americans, a Mormon Example. Uh, the book was remarkable to me as a young scholar interested in queer Mormon history because I had seen so much work that completely ignored women's queer experience and identity during the 19th century. And um, I had seen work with a much more recent focus than that that similarly ignored women. So Quinn answered that he had driven all over the state of Utah to various high schools looking at old poetry journals published by English or literature departments at these high schools. Uh, searching for poetry written by young women that address romantic friendships or similar themes, um, which is quite an undertaking, right? Um, but I argue that we must be willing to put in substantial work, whatever our own equivalent of driving around the state of Utah may be, uh, to recover non-male histories of queerness and Mormonism. I think this is some, somewhat outside the scope of Tabernacles of Clay, um, but again, I did promise you I would get into the weeds, um, and I hope that future scholars will use the book's insights around why homosexuality has so often been imagined as male, um, to push towards studies of non-male queerness. 
And now we turn to the family of proclamation to the world, that ever present document in discussions of Mormonism and gender and sexuality. Uh, quote, gender roles were central to the message of the proclamation, not biological sex, end quote, Petrie argues. However, how do gender and sex slip between each other in mainstream LDS usage? Uh, when an average, and we can debate what constitutes average later if you'd like, uh, Mormon reads the proclamation, are they consciously distinguishing between those two or are they reading it in a way that conflates or provides slippage between the two? Uh, by this I mean that in reading the proclamation, many Mormons do not actively distinguish between gender roles and physical sex but see the two as an inseparable whole. I am not convinced that the sex-gender divide makes sense in thinking about how many Mormons read the document. How else might we be able to read the document in ways that question the dominant narrative about Mormonism and gender? I'm also finally interested in the role of disability in discourses about same-sex attraction and marriage in LDS culture. Uh, mainly questions of what happens post-mortally to people who experience same-sex attraction or who are gay or trans or however non-normative experiences of gender and sexuality are named by the people who experience them um, have come into contact with Mormon ideas about what happens to people with disabilities post-mortally. Uh, most explicitly, this has emerged in an official LDS context context in an interview in which Lansky Wickman, a uh, member of the 70 to quote Petrie, quote, compared the condition of same-sex marriage to the mental handicap of his own daughter, end quote. Um, and I want to read the full relevant quote from Wickman to provide context from where I'm going from here. Um, Wickman said that, and this is a long quote, so I apologize, but bear with me. Quote, I happen to have a handicapped daughter. She's a beautiful girl. She'll be 27 next week. Her name is Courtney. Courtney will never marry in this life, yet she looks wistfully upon those who do. She will stand at the window of my house, overlooks the brides and their new husbands as they're having their pictures taken. She is at once captivated by it and saddened because Courtney understands it will not be her experience here. Courtney didn't ask for the circumstances into which she was born in this life any more than somebody with same gender attraction did. So there are lots of kinds of anguish people can have, even associated with just this matter of marriage. What we look forward to and the great promise of the gospel is that whatever our inclinations here, whatever our shortcomings here, whatever experiences to our enjoying a full discord, a fullness of joy here, we have the Lord's assurance for every one of us that those in due course will be removed. We just need to remain faithful, end quote. So I see similarities between discourses about disability and sexuality and those, how those targeted by those discourses have responded and how social construction of identity plays a role in both of these conversations. So both the homosexual and the disabled person are social constructs that mean real experiences but exceed and attempt to define them in ways that those experiencing those things uh, may not necessarily. So Petrie has dealt quite well in his book, uh, if you haven't read it yet, with the construction of the homosexual in Mormon thought. Um, if you're unconvinced about, the, about disability as a social construct, look up social versus medical models of disability. Um, but both are seen in Mormon cosmology as examples of something negative that was some, not asked for and was not anyone's fault that will be removed from a person for a more perfect existence in the next life. Both the LGBTQIA and disability communities have rejected notions that there is something inherently wrong with them, but have pushed back with the idea that it is their treatment by society, not same-sex attraction, et cetera, or disability in and of itself that is the problem. More work needs to be done on Mormonism and disability, and this is an area that provides the opportunity to do so in an intersection with gender and sexuality. Um, in preparation for this panel, wanting to make sure I wasn't leaving anything out, I actually searched disability in similar terms on both Dialogue and the Journal of Mormon History and got either no results or tangentially related material. Um, and I know past Sunstone Symposiums have addressed Mormonism and disability, but published work is really thin on the ground. Um, Blair Hodges has done significant and valuable work on Mormonism and disability, namely in his MA thesis on intellectual disability in 19th century Mormon thought. Um, I published an article with my colleague Terry Shoemaker thinking about dis disability and notions of public life in Mormon and evangelical thought that engages those intersections with queer Mormon discourses. And I look forward to future work that explores these future parallels, fruitful parallels, excuse me. Uh, Taylor, thank you for the book. Thanks for providing this opportunity for us to talk about it, and I am done. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. Um, Jacqueline, you are next for us today, um, and I, you're already unmuted because you're prepared. Thank you so much. All right. All right, good afternoon. I am very excited to have this opportunity to uh, reflect on Dr. Dr. Petrie's excellent book with you all today. 
A little bit about myself and where I approach this book from. I'm a queer Mormon-ish person and I'm a historian of science and religion in American empire. Um, when I study Mormonism, I typically focus on the era from the turn of the 20th century leading up until World War II, so right before Tabernacles of Clay really kicks off. And I look at how science and religion are both very powerful tools in constructing knowledge and enforcing cultural norms, and how they often serve the same goals in colonialism and imperialism, even though we typically perceive science and religion to be at odds with one another in American culture. Um, and ta Tabernacles of Clay is a really great example of that, particularly in regards to how Petrie traces how the church envisioned the etiology of gender and sexuality through psychology, biology, and theory theologies of embodiment through the prism of nature as a normative construct. And I'm going to spend the bulk of my review discussing these aspects of the book, and then I'm going to get on my soapbox for a moment. And then I'm going to suggest some avenues of where we go from here in the study of queer Mormon history. And before I do that, I just want to emphasize that Alex and I did not coordinate at all on what we were going to say. <laughs> so Petrie argues that LDS approaches to gender and sexuality are marked by this inherent tension. On the one hand, uh, gender and heterosexuality are, are an expression of these eternally consistent divine laws. On the other hand, church leaders um, have constantly expressed this anxiety about gender and sexual fluidity and tend in practice to treat heterosexuality as the end result of achieving these culturally specific performed gender roles. So masculinity, femininity, and heterosexuality as expressions of masculinity and femininity are produced by society in this view, even though they're supposed to be innate. And this contradiction is constantly coming into tension with larger shifts in American culture around LGBT activism, feminism, and changing scientific and legal approaches to LGBT issues. And at any given moment, if you just uh, take snapshots of moments in time, the church claims to have both an eternally and internally consistent doctrine around gender and sexuality. But in reality, the contradiction between these two ideas paves the way for shifts and accommodations that evolve over the course of the 20 and 21st centuries, while kind of providing cover to say that there hasn't been any shifts and that we've always taught the same thing. And as these accommodations occur, the church is continually responding to psychologists, biologists, and other scientists, um, either appealing to them as a source of authority or deriding them as the worldly philosophies of men that are kind of stumbling around in the dark without the light of revelation. So where Petrie's book kicks off in the 1940s, Mormonism is undergoing a seismic shift in regards to its relationship with science. So in 1874, John Draper's History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science articulated what's known as the conflict thesis, which posits that the conflict between science and religion is inevitable and that this conflict is a transhistorical norm. This is obviously really reductionist, but it quickly came to feel like common sense in an America that was experiencing these ongoing debates in the early 20th century over evolution, race, um, and other contentious topics that drew heavily on both religion and science in the early 20th century culture wars. Jacqueline, can you hold on for just a second for me? Yeah. I am having a small technical error, I believe. I can see your share, and it's wonderful, I should mention, but for some reason I am seeing that participants are still seeing Alexandria, which is lovely, but <laughs> okay, wait, wait, let me see if I can figure out what I did, because I'm sure it's user error on my part. And I apologize. I think you like spotlighted me or something like that. I had before, but you are unspotlighted now. Um, if my attendees can now see the, the screen share, could you please raise your hand for a second for me? Because it's such a good screen share and so helpful. Okay, good, yay! I did it. All right. 
back to business. Go right ahead. Thank you. And I'm so sorry, Jacqueline, to have to interrupt no, such a good. Okay. So we have this 1874 conflict thesis between science and religion that science and religion have always conflicted. You know, you have Galileo and the Catholic Church, you have, you know, throughout history forever. Um, and this starts to feel like common sense in America. But Mormonism actually holds out a lot longer than most conservative uh, Christianity in um, really buying into the conflict thesis because um, we have this unique relationship between science and revelation that gets articulated in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that uh, science and religion ultimately are meant to synthesize and not conflict that truth is truth, no matter where it comes from. And that as science and religion are both in pursuit of truth, any discrepancies between the two are the result of temporary mortal misunderstandings rather than a fundamental conflict between the two fields. However, the more creative and flexible religio-scientific syntheses of James Talmadge, John Whitstow, Beach, Roberts, etc., eventually give way to the Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce McConkie approach of reconciling religion and science, which, um, I mean, we've all read Mormon Doctrine, it places a much higher priority on the religious approach to discerning truth than the scientific. And so this moment of change in um, Mormon approaches to the relationship between science and religion against this background of this ongoing American um, conversation between the two topics is where Petrie comes in to discussing the LDS responses to gender and sexuality. And what Petrie traces is the evolution from nature and the created order self-evidently prescribing patriarchal gender roles and heteronormativity to a scientific slash psychological solution to nature in order to mold correct gender performance to an abandonment of more mortal nature in, in favor of the eternal nature, which prioritizes this idealized extraterrestrial heterosexual version of the human being, which represents God's will better than the created world and mortal experiences. So in other words, at the beginning of the 20th century, Mormon leaders believed that we could use science and nature to empirically discover eternal laws, but by the end of the 20th century, when psychology and biology had begun to frame homosexuality, homosexuality as a natural and harmless part of human diversity, nature becomes this unreliable narrator and church leaders refuse to accept ma mainstream scientific consensus as a normative authority on questions of gender and sexuality. Which is not to say that church leaders rejected science. They had spent many years being profoundly influenced by psychological treatments for homosexuality grounded in new thought therapeutic approaches, which PG does a really excellent job of tracing um, their involvement with the psychology and that long after the psychological treatments have been rejected by the American Psychological Association for a lack of effectiveness, church leaders argued that um, these reparative therapy approaches represent true science whereas moves to depathologize and accept homosexuality are purely grounded in political motivations rather than representing a legitimate change in scientific consensus and understanding. So church leaders continue to preach that science and religion would ultimately agree with one another, but Mormon claims to revelation end up predetermining acceptable scientific conclusions. Mormon leaders adopted the tools and discourses of secular psychologists to create new institutions of knowledge that could appeal to scientific and religious authority while countering uh, secularism and homosexual acceptance. And some of these new institutions borrow heavily from parallel ex-gay treatments in conservative Catholic and evangelical American Christianity. But um, Petrie ends up arguing that Mormonism quietly incorporates psychological frameworks into their doctrines and teachings um, in a very unique way. And this argument accords really nicely with John Brooks' 1991 Science and Religion, which uh, to date represents the most in-depth response to John Draper's 1874 conflict conflict thesis. And Brooke synthesizes this overview of the relationship between science and religion that replaces this, the conflict thesis with the complexity thesis, which argues that no single thesis of conflict, harmony, integration, or separation can characterize the historical relationship of science and religion. And instead, science and religion occupy a thoroughly entangled relationship that includes conflict, but conflict is primarily a byproduct of this entanglement rather than the primary feature of the relationship. And so this approach um, over the 20th century uh, by LDS general authorities uh, creates what Petrie terms parallel epistemic regimes, 
rather than repudiating science, which can be seen in Dallin Oaks's response to early scientific accounts of gay genes. P Petrie argues that Oaks fully appropriated the language of science for his own ends, claiming to consult with qualified scientists and practitioners to refute the idea that sexuality is inborn, while simultaneously hedging some bets on the possibility that scientific evidence might still vindicate the bio biological determinist position. And this is the context in which the clinical language of same-sex attraction comes into prominence within Mormon discourse. In Oakes's view of homosexuality, nature no longer re represents a reliable set of data from which Mormon scientists can discern God's eternal laws. Instead, nature is an inherently flawed data set that has been corrupted by the fall. And only legitimate scientists who accept the predetermined conclusions of general authorities can reliably interpret the ideology of homosexuality. So he compares homosexuality to like addiction, anger management, and other moral psychological problems that have a biological basis, but represent the flawed natural man that God's commandments constrain us from following. And um, Petrie describes this as an anthropology of extraterrestrial heterosexuality. Um, my co-panelist Blair Osler has termed this teaching celestial queer genocide. And while 20th century church leaders used to decry homosexuality as unnatural, positioning nature as a normative patriarchal and heterosexual construct, at the dawn of the 21st century, church leaders rejected both nature and mortal experience as irrelevant to discerning the divine will. So despite this complete reversal in the role of nature in Mormonism's uh, scientific and religious epistemic regime, heterosexuality remains a norm. All right. So it's important to note that Oaks's innovation in describing homosexuality as a condition that results from flawed fallen bodies that can constitute a struggle or burden to be endured until the resurrection parallels ableist rhetoric surrounding disability in the Mormon community. And in disability studies, ableism is understood to undergird almost every other system of oppression because ableism is about adjudicating whose bodies are good and acceptable and whose bodies are not. And in the history of LGBT activism, both in broader American culture and in Mormonism, positioning queerness as good and acceptable has often led queer activists to distance themselves from disability in a way that often reifies ableist logics. Within Mormonism, this often takes the form of saying queerness isn't like disability and will not result in being made straight or cis in the resurrection, which reinforces the idea that disabled bodies will automatically attain to Western capitalist ableist standards once they have been perfected, which, in, which is an idea common in many Christian doctrines of the resurrection. And disability studies who work on religion and Christianity in general have critiqued this idea because it positions disability as a problem that can only be solved through divine intervention after the disabled person is dead, rather than as diversity, which can be accommodated by society. So in other words, ableist doctrines of the resurrection and embodiment negate the moral urgency of disability justice. Now, the disability community is not a monolith. Some disabled people don't want to be changed in the resurrection. Some do want their condition removed, and some only want certain aspects ameliorated or even question the utility of talking about disability or ability as a concept once our bodies have been so profoundly changed. To use an example that many of us can relate to, some people who wear glasses want 20-20 vision in the next life, whereas some people would prefer to have a pair of celestial spectacles that never smudge, fog up, glare, or slip down your nose. Still others think that the question is irrelevant because an all-seeing God surely experiences vision in a way that our mortal selves can't even comprehend. However, all three of these people, despite their differing views on their vision in the next life, would probably agree that if the church refused to allow you to adjust the text size in the Gospel Library app and responded to all your requests for that feature by saying, you'll be resurrected with perfect vision in the next life and just have to endure to the end until now, that would be a load of nonsense. So, as LGBT activists and allies in the church, let's not fall into the trap of dictating extraterrestrial ableism as we deconstruct extraterrestrial heteronormativity. And so Okay. And lastly, really quick, to talk about where we go from here, we need to consider the many ways in which Tabernacles of Clay is a really profoundly, definitively fantastic treatment of gender and sexuality in Mormonism. Petrie balances a comprehensive commitment to queer theory with really solid archival work, connects concerns over homosexuality to race, patriarchy, feminism, and American politics, 
and leaves no stone, un uh, no stone unturned when it comes to examining the institutional church. He's also very sensitive to ways in which cis women and trans members are sidelined in LDS treatments of homosexuality. And while he doesn't devote a lot of time to trans lesbian and trans identities specifically, the approach of uh, approaching uh, homosexuality uh, through the lens of a more comprehensive look at gender gives a lot more insight into these identities than previous books on homosexuality and Mormonism. However, we need lesbian and trans voices. I feel really comfortable saying that Tabernacles of Play is going to be the foundational text on the institutional history of Mormonism and homosexuality for quite some time. And because of that, we need to stop focusing on what church leaders have said and done about homosexuality and start focusing on producing cultural histories of queer marginalized genders. We need to dig deep into cataloging and producing archival and oral histories of lesbian, queer, and trans members of the church who have navigated their identities in the face of institutional silence. We need books that center on them specifically. We need to do the legwork in assembling these sources and looking beyond the traditional Mormon studies canon to find them. And when we do, I feel very confident that Tabernacles of Clay is going to be an incredibly helpful roadmap in interpreting and contextualizing those voices. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, between what you and Alexandria were saying, I hadn't made that connection with disability before. And I think that that's particularly fascinating being partially disabled myself and going, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that from that way, that, that perspective before. OK, now we're going to give the floor to Patrick. Um, and right. I will. Unmute you? Nope. Trying again. That was okay, my fault. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Well, those were terrific presentations and responses from Alex and 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 Jacqueline. Um, I I thought um, I actually had something arrive in the mail that I thought I would we could just read from in lieu of my presentation. I recently received this issue, uh, so we could talk about sexuality from a gospel. Uh, perspective. Um, so maybe I'll just take my 15 minutes to, to read some of that. Um, but uh, no, I'm, I'm going to today, I'm, I'm going to uh, approach the book from a Mormon studies perspective. And I'm going to uh, start by <laughs> sort of embarrassingly, but, um, but I'm past embarrassment. I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to quote myself to start. Bold, original, and timely, Tabernacles of Clay is a field-defining book that does for Latter-day Saints what they've never fully done for themselves. Lend a degree of ideological continuity to their shifting views about gender, sexuality, and marriage. A landmark step forward in both documenting and theorizing modern church teaching on sexuality and sexual difference. This is a work that Mormon Studies has been waiting for and will come back to again and again. So as soon as I received a draft manuscript of Taylor Petrie's book, Tabernacles of Clay, I recognized that I had something special in my hands. I knew that Taylor had been working on a book about gender and sexuality in modern Mormonism, but I thought it was gonna be theological in nature, similar to his articles, Rethinking Mormonism's Heavenly Mother and Toward a Post-Heterosexual Mormon Theology, which by the way, in my opinion, deserves to be recognized as one of the most thought-provoking and innovative scholarly articles ever published on Mormonism, specifically uh, Mormon theology. So Taylor had already, in my mind, established himself as one of the most important contemporary thinkers about the theological aspects of gender and sexuality in Mormonism. And I expected to be dazzled and challenged with more of the same. So what did Taylor do instead? Well, he went way outside his field of primary specialization, which is early Christianity, and wrote a book about modern American religious and cultural history. Now, any academic should immediately recognize what an ambitious and audacious project this is, to take up a project two millennia and an ocean removed from your, from your own training. But the thing that really annoys me about Taylor is that not only did he do this, the very thought of which would make most scholars tremble, but he did it so damn well. I meant every word of the blurb that I wrote about the manuscript, and I mean it even more now that I've seen and read the published book. In fact, I wanna go so far as to say that Tabernacles of Clay is an instant classic. 
it does something truly rare and remarkable. It not only describes and analyzes the Mormon past, but it makes sense of the Latter-day Saint tradition in a way that the tradition and its members have struggled to do for themselves. In this respect, I would put Tabernacles of Clay in the very limited and elite company of books like Jan Ships' Mormonism, Armin Moss's The Angel and the Beehive, and Paul Reeves' Religion of a Different Color. Although they're all very different books, I see a common strategy deployed by Ships, Moss, Reeves, and now Petrie. All four authors apply theory to their sources, to their deep archival research, and then let the sources speak back to the theory. For Ships, it was religious studies theory. For Moss, it was Weberian church sex theories. For Reeve, it was critical race theory and especially whiteness studies. Here we see Petrie not so much applying his knowledge of early Christianity, although I would love to hear him talk about whether there's any sort of cross-fertilization there, but rather his deep familiarity, even expertise with modern theories of gender and sexuality, especially queer theory. He outlines his intellectual influences, Michel Foucault, Thomas Foucault, uh, Eve Sedgwick, Judith Butler, uh, Siobhan Somerville. We have to recognize that Petrie could only accomplish what he did because of his expertise in modern gender and queer theory. He could not have written this book simply by going to the sources. He needed a framework, a lens through which to view the sources and see what others, including the subjects in his study, couldn't see. At the same time, his theory did not overdetermine his analysis. Indeed, one of the contributions of this book, which I hope gets picked up in the fields of gender and queer theory, is the ways that it revises existing theory by showing how Mormon resistance to essentialism was a thoroughly modern project, not a relic of pre-modernity or a sign of anti-modernity. For students of Mormon studies or history in general, Tabernacles of Clay is a sterling example of how theory can and should interact with sources, with both informing and interrogating one another. Another thing that impresses me about Tabernacles of Clay is Petrie's reticence, which is a strange thing to say about a book that makes such strong claims. This book deals with some of the most controversial topics in contemporary American society, gender, sexuality, and marriage. These are topics that are easily given to advocacy-based scholarship. No doubt Taylor has his personal views, but this is a work of history, not advocacy. In this regard, I think it would be, it, would, it makes an interesting contrast to look at this alongside Joanna Brooks's new book, Mormonism and White Supremacy. I expect that some readers will think they know enough from looking at the cover with the Salt Lake Temple's reflection filtered through rainbow colors, or will throw up their hands at the first mention of queer theory. Some will perceive Tabernacles of Clay, uh, some will perceive behind Tabernacles of Clay an activist agenda designed to undermine or destabilize the current church's leadership, the current church leadership's teachings on gender, sexuality, and marriage. Indeed, Presidents Nelson and especially Oakes are prominent figures in the book's last two chapters. It's clear through his careful dismantling of some of their past arguments, for instance, the 2008 document, The Divine Institution of Marriage, that Petrie does not accept many, if not most, of the rationales promoted over the years by LDS ecclesiastical leaders to support their positions. But he does so not through personal disagreement or moralizing, but rather through logical and clear analysis of their internal contradictions. Petrie has written a rock solid book that describes, analyzes, and theorizes, but never editorializes. On virtually every page, Taber Tabernacles of Clay offers a compelling witness that Petrie or any other scholar doesn't need to do a whole lot to destabilize LDS teachings on gender, marriage, and equality, precisely because church leaders have spent a half century doing that very thing. At the same time, one of the things that I love about this book is Petrie's generosity towards his subjects, even or especially those whose arguments he critiques. For instance, in his assessment of Spencer W. Kimball's many writings and teachings about homosexuality, Petrie acknowledges that Kimball's sincerity matched his severity. I think Petrie really believes that most, if not all LDS leaders who made severe statements about feminism and homosexuality 
did so motivated by sincere religious commitment and their own sense of what was best for people rather than out of spite or animus. Of course, as Petrie notes repeatedly, those same paternalistic tendencies justified any number of attitudes or behaviors that we would now find reprehensible, such as the church leader's virulent opposition to interracial marriage, especially between blacks and whites through the end of the 1970s. So how much do sincerity and good intentions count when put in the service of causes that in hindsight we thoroughly reject? This is a question that ethicists and the general public have wrestled with at least since World War II, and which is central in our current debates about addressing racial injustice in America. In Tabernacles of Clay, Petrie has given us a model of how historians can act in our role as historians. We lay out the facts as we find them. We make sense of them the best we can through careful analysis and argumentation. We avoid personal normative judgments. We articulate our historical subjects' arguments in a way that would be recognizable to them. And we critique them for internal flaws and inconsistencies rather than any failure to anticipate or correspond to later societal developments. I think this is particularly important in our scholarship and public conversations around the fraught issues of gender, sexuality, and marriage. If Petrie's book shows anything, it is how recently and rapidly our culture's views have changed on all of these topics. He correctly concludes that the teachings and practices of the LDS Church in the early 21st century would already be unrecognizable to Mormon leaders in the mid 20th century. That statement can easily be broadened to all of American society. For instance, as he notes, it was only 25 years ago, within, I would say, probably the lifetime of everybody watching today, that many states passed legislation refusing to recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states. And the federal government, under democratic leadership, passed the Defense of Marriage Act, which denied federal recognition of same-sex marriages conducted in individual states. California's Defense of Marriage Initiative, Proposition 22, passed with 61% support of voters in 2000. That's only 20 years ago, folks. Latter-day Saints would have made up only 1% to 2% of those votes. So I don't think I'm overstating the case when I say that American society's embrace of gay rights, homosexuality, and same-sex marriage constitutes the most rapid and substantial transformation of attitudes on a constellation of major social issues in the entire history of the nation, possibly the history of the world. That's a big statement, but it might be true. Recall that many of the men who led the LDS church into the late 20th century were born in the 19th century. And let's not forget that many liberals, including Barack Obama, only joined the gay marriage party in the 2010s. Keeping in mind that context, as Petrie consistently does, helps soften our retrospective judgment of LDS leaders who were obviously blindsided and bewildered, like all of us, by the rapidity of social change in late 20th century America. So I'm gonna conclude with a few random notes and questions that Taylor may or may not choose to take up in, in his response. So first of all, this book is beautifully and clearly written. If any of you have ever tried to read some of the theorists that Petrie cites, you'll know what, is, what an impressive achievement it is to make queer theory comprehensible. There are so many great turns of phrase here. And the title of chapter two, Sodom and Gomorrah, that's worth the price of admission just by itself. I mean, just, just brilliant, all right. Okay, Taylor pointed this out at various junctures, but I was struck by the distinctiveness of Latter-day Saint scriptural hermeneutics, especially when conducted by prophets and apostles. The paradigmatic example of this in the book is Spencer W. Kimball's creative reading of Genesis 1 and 2, which Petrie adeptly notes was not justified based on close linguistic analysis, but only on Kimball's own sense that the text was not quite right. It was a good example of the situational freedom LDS leaders could use when interpreting scripture. This is a brilliant insight that deserves a book all on its own about LDS hermeneutics. I was also struck by the church's inability to craft arguments that were persuasive to anyone other than those who were already inclined to be persuaded, particularly church members. I suspect this is because Latter-day Saint leaders have never developed a rhetoric of persuasion only one of authority. They have traditionally offered doctrinal pronouncements, not theological reflections. This dynamic too is worthy, worthy of future study. 
But this leads to a larger question for Taylor, namely, do you see any paths of influence from Latter-day Saint leaders and authors to the general culture, even to other religious conservatives? The reverse paths of influence from external sources into the Latter-day Saint discourse are clear, though I think we could do more to trace some of the specific genealogies. But while Mormons were increasingly participants and sometimes even leaders of religious coalitions fighting against the ERA and same-sex marriage, can you identify any particular arguments, data points, or lines of reasoning, uh, le reasoning that originated with Mormons and then were successfully adopted by others? Okay, one more observation. Throughout the book, the LDS doctrine of the pre-mortal existence plays the function of a kitchen sink here. You can throw absolutely anything into the pre-mortal existence. It is remarkable that over and over, whenever Latter-day Saint leaders didn't have an actual scriptural or theological source to lean on to support their opinions on race or gender, they simply invoked the pre-mortal existence. Again, I think Petrie is right, and this is something that, that other people could, could uh, do even more with. This shows them engaged in a creative project, not strict fidelity to tradition. It reveals the power of vague and undefined concepts within the religion, including Heavenly Mother, and the relative youth of the tradition that allows for ongoing development and innovation. So in conclusion, I just wanna once again offer my praise for this incredible book, a true scholarly achievement that I believe will be a landmark in the field of Mormon studies and a conversation shaper as Mormons and Mormonism or whatever we call them now, uh, continue to wrestle with these weighty issues. Other scholars will certainly have more to say in the future, but Taylor Petrie has set an extremely high bar. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, now that, you know, Taylor's starting to blush and feel like super embarrassed and might want to crawl under his chair while everybody brags on him. Um, I, I was just thinking about what you said about the, the cover of the book, and that's how my, uh, my book review started, because I put, put it on the table and my father said, oh, I know what that's about. And I said, yeah, but you don't really. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Blair, I believe we're ready for you. Are you prepared and ready for us? I think so, yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, okay, I'm just going to start by saying I'm just going to talk with you all. Um, I am not the type of person to be impressed by academic credentials. I'm impressed by quality of content, and I want to look at the content. I don't care where you got your PhD from or whatever, or if you're a stay-at-home mom who just reads a ton of books all day long. The work will show through, and I think in a lot of ways here, Taylor, the work showed through. The work showed through. There is a lot of good things happening. Um, but before I get into that, I want to talk just for a tiny, tiny second about identity politics and how um, sometimes some of the things, uh, you know, I don't, I don't wake up in the morning thinking, you know what, you know what this world needs? One more book on queer theory written by a straight person. <laughs> But the highest compliment I can give you, Taylor, is that I actually do wake up and look forward to listening to what you have to say about queer theory. So that's one of the highest compliments I can give you. I'm gonna give you about five more compliments, and then I'm gonna move into some critiques. I'm, I, I have some small disagreements with some of the things Patrick said, but um, we'll get there, we'll get there. So first, um, I totally agree with a lot of the praise that's being said right now. Um, Taylor, I just wanted to thank you for talking about sexual and gender fluidity. It is the taboo topic that nobody wants to talk about, and it's a problem in so many ways because we have the born that way argument and um, trans medicalists and all these different things going on, but we don't want to talk about you know, uh, gender and sexual fluidity. So thank you, one, for putting this on the map that we can actually have the conversation now. So let's do it, right? Let's do it. Two, um, as other people mentioned, this book is accessible. You do not have to have a philosophy degree. You don't have to have read all of Foucault and Butler and Sartre. You don't have to read all that. You're good. You're good. You can pick this up and you can start reading it. So that's amazing. And it's really well organized. I'm an organized girl. I love it when it's organized and this is it. And um, a second, uh, the other thing I was going to say is the book does a really good job of hitting at some really hard intersections. This is not an easy task to bring up things like civil rights, 
um, queer theory, feminist theory, all these kinds of things and how they interweave together. Um, sometimes we like to pretend that we put our race box over here and we put our sexuality box here and we put our gender box here, but really they're all interweaving together. And Taylor nicely, very nicely has um, addressed a lot of these topics within the context of the book. And um, I'm really proud, proud of the work. Um, I really like your work on feminist theory. I feel like this is where you shine. I can tell you've read, you've done your homework. This is good. Okay, you're getting it. This, this, uh, I really like the way you describe um, patriarchal norms and gender as a system of needing policing. That gender isn't just something like totally natural and biological, but it, it requires policing. Um, the other thing is, is I love listening to history books written by people who know philosophy and who know uh, theology and theory and um, not to knock all the doctors and dentists who have written books on those things. It's just really refreshing <laughs> to um, read this from Taylor. And then the last thing I do want to take note of that I feel like you did that I actually, one of the reasons I still continue to read Taylor's work is because um, one of the biggest problems I have with academia, and I've read my fair share, is that sometimes academics have a tendency to treat these narratives, these stories, because that's what these histories are, stories, um, like an academic experiment. Like, look at the queers over there. Let's, let's, let's go analyze them and figure them out. We'll plot them on a chart and check off our suicide rate things and everything. It's like, no, 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 no. These are people's actual real lives and real lived experiences. And I think one thing Taylor does a really good job of, of recognizing the humanity of writing a historical narrative. Because there's no, so I, I'm really postmodern. I'm like, there's no objectivity. There's no unbiased, you know, great. I, I think logic and rationality are overrated in so many ways. You're telling a story. And I think you do a really, really great job of that. So moving on to, I'm in, I, I limit myself to three tiny, teeny critiques. Um, so one, uh, you talk a lot in feminist theory and I love the way you talk about um, policing the gender. As I said, policing gender norms, especially for women. Like we've got to make sure women stay in their place. There's one area in the book though, where you talk a little bit about like working moms, right? and um, how that's being affected in like women entering masculine spaces and things like that. And one teeny tiny semantic distinction, I kept putting marks in the book, was you, there needs to be a clarification between working moms outside the home and working moms inside the home. Because it's not just a matter of working moms and not working moms, moms inside the home are still working even though they're not getting a paycheck by a capitalist economy that doesn't value alienated unpaid labor of every time I scrub poop out of the you know carpet right so I kept checking and I, tr I trust you agree with me a little bit and there were a few times you actually did make the distinction you said moms who work outside the home I was like yes 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 so there was a few times I just wanted to make sure that that didn't get uh, misread because I think there is a tendency within feminist thought too to be like oh, I'm not valued until capitalism gives me my paycheck, right? Like the labor I do, the things. And so we turn to religion and over here on religion, we have benevolent patriarchy who's ready to put up on, on our pet. Your work is so sacred. You don't need a paycheck. So like we have both, uh, we have like capitalist feminism and then we have patriarchal benevolence feminism over here. And so I just wanted to make that distinction clear because like women are put in the possible position of being like, hey, are we so awesome that we deserve a paycheck or so awesome we don't deserve a paycheck? Like what's going on here? So that's one teeny, teeny, tiny thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was this idea of, um, uh, so this is a really postmodern view that you're painting here. I was like, I, as I was reading it, I was like, how long until he quotes Foucault? Oh, I'm like, the introduction, perfect, here we go. So you quote Foucault and Butler and all these philosophers with like very postmodern ideas. And I didn't see a lot of philosophers who deal more with the scientific and biological. And, I, and, and again, I don't wanna be critical of like, this wasn't in the book because we can sit and criticize all day long things that are not in the book right you know and that's just a waste of everybody's time but i do think that it is worth stating somewhere in the book when you're talking about gender this idea of intersex erasure 
we pretend that um, when things get so postmodern and so social constructivist that we don't recognize that the actual hard biology, which again is its own type of social constructivism, I'm okay with science being social construct too, but when we don't tie in the hardcore biology of recognizing, the church is failing to recognize that biological sex is a spectrum. So I would have loved to have seen um, in the policing of gender how the church has actually policed biologies. Like someone like myself, like, I, it, well, just the gender binary isn't just socially constructed, it is surgically constructed. Like we will cut bodies to make them fit this binary. And so the church has participated in that. And there's been a couple examples too of like, um, you know, intersex persons finding out later they're intersex and then have transitioned to another gender and the church was okay with that and they let it happen. Why? Because they're intersex. But God forbid we do it for a trans person, right? Like, so I would have loved to see a little more there touching on the fluidity of the intersex experience. And then, okay, so for my last critique, this is the big one. This is the one where you broke my heart a little, Taylor, but it's okay. I still love you. I'm still going to keep reading your work, but this one broke my heart a little bit. So I'm going to talk about bi erasure, as you might have already expected. Um, so at the beginning of the book, you talk a lot about gay and lesbian activism within, you know, uh, various fields and various areas, and you, you neglected to say bisexuals too. And I know that sounds like just like, oh, identity politics, every, let's represent every letter of the alphabet soup. And it's not that, it's actually bigger than that. And I'll explain why. Um, because bisexual people have been doing the activist work along our gay and lesbian peers the whole time, but we either appear to you guys, we're like chameleons, right? We either appear to you guys as the gays or the straights just depending on who we were holding hands with at that particular moment. And so there's a little bit of bi erasure happening at the beginning, but it didn't break my heart until the end, Taylor. <laughs> so we're getting towards the end of the book and you start talking about um, uh, the reconstructing or the resurrection of the homosexual and things like that. And you didn't mention bisexuals until you started talking about trans issues, which yay, like, well, thumbs way up. Like the fact that there was even a section on the trans issue, I'm like, yes, yes, let's start it. Let's have the conversation. Um, but we were only mentioned in there. Uh, and this, and again, this is the reason why it's really, really important. And I don't know how aware of this you are or how not, but I do trust that like you have this big compassionate heart that wants to, you know, see this. So um, part of the reason uh conversion therapy has considered to be quote so successful is because bisexual people were experiencing conversion therapy and when a bi person experiences conversion therapy versus an exclusively homosexual person con experiences conversion therapy what we're really seeing is just a redirection of an already kind of fluid and malleable sexual orientation and so this has actually happened byu has actually cited work of oh, look, conversion therapy has been 60% successful, and I'm using air quotes for anyone who can't see me right now, 60% successful without even once mentioning it was by people that were basically just being redirected, you know, just a little bit of more malleability there to work with. And so what happened was by people were weaponized. We were weaponized to hurt our gay and lesbian siblings. And when we hurt our gay and lesbian si siblings, guess what happened? They got mad at us, the weapon, right? We were the weapon. So we started being excluded from queer spaces, excluded these because we were just a little too malleable. We were just a little too inconvenient. So then we went into these straight, face, uh, straight spaces to have the conversation, but we were just a little too queer, a little too malleable, a little too fluid. When, you are, you, when you're a chameleon, you're only okay within the designated area, you know, of where you're allowed to be this thing here and this thing there. And so when we're painting out the history, like, again, this is a book about the history of sexual fluidity and sexual malleability within Mormonism. You have to have an entire section on bi people and bi people's experiences with conversion therapy. And not only that, um, how bi people have literally, one, been weaponized and then kicked out and then literally erased from our own history. We were erased from our own history. And I think that's the biggest problem. And um, I think I, and I, another thing, like when I'm reading these kinds of books, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna pretend like I'm super objective here. I'm not, I'm biased. 
the first thing I think of when I read these books is impact. How is this going to impact people? Because people are going to take this, you know, historical narrative and add something. And so what happens is, is when you erase by people from the conversation, it further creates a wedge. And, and, I'm, and this comes off as I'm blaming Taylor for the oppression of by people. I'm not. I'm not saying that. But I am saying it does create wedges within the queer community. And you know who gets to carry that? by people we're the ones who get to carry that we're because and i know because it's happened to me like i go into these queer spaces and i've literally been told yeah uh we don't talk about sexual fluidity here because my grandma can't handle it so it's kind of reminiscent of like white feminism like hey we can't get everyone the white but we can't get everyone the right to vote but at least we can get white women the right to vote it's like mm, that's kind of crappy feminism i don't like that you know, I'm not going to do that. That's yucky. And so that's kind of what happens right now. Oh, look, we can't legitimize all homosexuality. So we're just going to make sure the gays are okay. And just the buys, you just mm, go do your thing, you know, just go do it. And this is actually reflective in the mental health statistics. So bi people and trans people are on par about the same as each other with mental health statistics, because there really is um, a lot of overlap and similarity with the bi trans experience. I won't get into that, that's outside the scope of the book. But what I did wanna say is like, I love your work, you do amazing work. So many of the accolades are well-deserved, definitely. This is not an easy project you're taking on here. It's not, it's not. And you did a really, really good job. I just just you can't erase me from my own history man you can't do that like that 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 shit's traumatic okay oh i can't say shit oh, oh i just said it again sorry i don't just bleh. hey this is the part where heather just like cuts me off no but anyway it's really really good i'd like to see more on hard biology and intersex people um a little more clarification in feminist issues and just um we got to start talking about bisexuality and fluidity a little bit more because it's a real thing and we just need to stop weaponizing it just because somebody's fluid and someone's not doesn't mean one is more legitimate worse or bad than the other we just need to stop hurting each other it's not okay Anyway, you're amazing, Taylor. I loved it. I'm going to keep reading more of your work and I'm going to keep coming back for more and keep criticizing it because I think you're doing amazing things. I think I just saw Taylor's brain start working on another chapter, like right as you were talking. And we were, we were all sitting there thinking, second edition with notes, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Magnificent. And I'm so glad that you were discussing intersex because we actually have questions already discussing fluidity and intersex. Um, Taylor, are you ready for us? Uh, Maybe-ish. I need to catch my breath after all of that. That was um, overwhelming. Uh, I am incredibly, incredibly grateful for the amazingly close readings of this book for people taking it so seriously and for the time and attention that the panelists gave to it including the critical comments those are so so important so thank you thank you all for all of the nice and the mean things that you said about me just now um i i hope that the book can serve as the beginnings the foundation of the next kinds of conversations that our community needs to be having um, and uh, to the extent that, that the book has inaugurated that in this brief way, in just this small conversation here, I'm deeply humbled and grateful for that. And, and especially to uh, the audience who's listening in here, thank you all for your attention to this and your interest in this. If you have or hadn't read, read the book, hopefully the conversation has been somewhat comprehensible, uh, but, but thank you all for your attention to this. I'm, I'm deeply humbled and flattered that people care about this. Um, as many people know, these kinds of conversations are often sidelined. They're often not taken seriously. They are um, considered to be, you know, a, a, a subspecialty of scholarship rather than getting to kind of the, the big generational questions that we're facing. And so, um, so to the extent that people um, uh, pay, pay attention to this kind of work, again, I'm just incredibly grateful. Um, I just try, I, I was, I have seven pages of notes of everything that everybody said, so I won't be able to, to respond to everything poor, sort of impressionistically maybe, but I thought that I could maybe talk a little bit about some of the main points that were jumping out to me. Um, 
I am deeply grateful that people notice the, the attention to the issues of science and uh, uh, questions of the re relationship between um, LDS thought and scientific belief as uh, an important element of the book. And I have to say that for myself, I was totally surprised by that as an avenue of research. When I originally sketched out what this project was going to be, I hadn't really considered the role of psychology, the role of psychotherapy uh, as uh, having some kind of determinative practice. But as soon as I started reading these sources and getting into what was going on and the kind of rhetoric that they were saying, it was all I could think about. And suddenly Freud was everywhere, you know? And uh, so I was so... Um, uh, surprised by that avenue of research and one that I felt like had not really been fully grappled with in the way that previous um, studies of this issue had uh, had happened, at least with respect to LDS uh, uh, thought. Uh, I was seeing it in the way that evangelicals and other Protestants, liberal Protestants were uh, being talked about and the relationship between science and religion and felt like there was, you know, really fertile ground to have that conversation in um, LDS studies. So, uh, thank you for noticing that and for calling attention to uh, to those issues. Um, related to this is, I think, also the questions around intersectionality, which I had some, you know, uh, pre understanding, some commitments to to that in theory, but hadn't really also understood before I started the project how those were deeply intertwined in this history. Again, I showed up at the beginnings of the research fellowship to work on this without either chapters one or two even conceived of in any way whatsoever. And so it was a huge uh, surprise really to, to be able to get into that research, the, the relationship between race, the relationship between uh, science that were, that were so important to this story. So thank you all for, uh, for noticing that. The broader set of uh, intersectional commitments that I think that the book attends to that some of you, uh, that, that uh, Jacqueline and Alex pointed to around disability is something that I think that does need a lot more work and a lot more thought. Um, notably, Alex said there's, uh, I think, one master's thesis on this and you know a handful of other articles, but this is a huge area of research that we need to do more of. Blair, I think that the Transhumanist Association has, has also considered uh, these issues in, in some more depth. But there is so much to say, and I'll, I'll just tell a brief sort of embarrassing story. Um, my first book on uh, gender and sexuality in the resurrection in early Christianity was followed up by a very important, uh, in my opinion, a really field-defining book as well by Candida Moss that takes a disabilities studies approach to the resurrection, builds on uh, uh, my book, on my first book, and, and, and does that. And so I'm humbled again if somebody takes a disability studies approach to this book as the second follow up uh, as well. That will be twice in my career that I've gotten scooped by disability studies people. Uh, but I think that there is so, so much to say about that avenue of research. And I hope that the glints that I tried to get at in this book and the you know, call is sort of putting a marker here, say, pay more attention to this, that more people will, uh, will pick up on those things and, um, and continue on in that research. And I hope to, uh, I hope to support that kind of work to, to the extent possible as well. Um, Alex, or I'm sorry, uh, Jacqueline's point about the end of institutional histories and the beginnings of cultural histories on, on this are, is hugely important. One, of course, Michael Quinn's uh, uh, 1996 book is, a, is an important step in, in this regards as well. And I, there was something that I felt a little embarrassed about going back to a kind of old fashioned institutional history. But because it hadn't been said and nobody had done it in, in a way that I was satisfied with up until that point, I, I felt like uh, I needed to do this and left, un unfortunately, untouched all of the other areas where we could do a lot more research. I gestured to this to say, you know, it, we would come up with a different timeline, I think, if we looked at different uh, uh, constituencies within the church. We would see the development of, of these ideas perhaps looking a little bit differently as they bubble up or, or as they're received. Uh, uh, than, than the, the story that I tell in this book. So again, I'm hopeful that this is the beginning, the foundations of that, and that uh, my book will, will inform those other ones, but absolutely those need to be done. And I hope, to, I hope to see more of those. I know a few people who are working on those kinds of projects as well, uh, but there definitely needs to be more and we need 
uh, I would say in addition to cultural histories, we need ethnographies. Um, so uh, just as a, a separate methodology entirely, I think that we just need to start telling these stories in, uh, in uh, totally different ways with new methodologies, with new approaches um, that, will, uh, that will really uh, help us peek into this world that many of us swim in and live in, but to give it some analytical tools there uh, as well. Um, let's see here, a couple of other, a uh, couple of other questions here. Um, Patrick's raised, uh, again, Patrick, you were way, way too nice to me. Thank you so much. But you raised some really important questions here about uh, the ethics of telling the past. And I want to comment on, um, to, to a certain extent, your surprise that I took on a historical project as opposed to a theological project, which had been the primary methodology that I had approached the issue uh, uh, up until that point. And I had imagined um, that I sort of, as I sort of had laid, uh, surveyed the landscape in the late 2000s and early 2010s, theology seemed like the field that really needed um, some, uh, some tuning up in, in terms of uh, bringing it into some uh, more sophisticated conversations around gender and sexuality. And so my original research was uh, along those lines. And um, I still feel that that's an incredibly important uh, uh, avenue of, of work, in part because um, theology seemed to me then and seems to be now to be the really the, the main barrier here, right? For, for Latter-day Saints thinking about a more inclusive um, uh, a kind of afterlife, a more inclusive kind of church in, in this world, the theological underpinnings of heterosexuality seem to be so unshakable and so stable that they needed to be uh, uh, thought through a little bit. And so I, I, I went in that direction. And originally the project, when I um, had conceived of it as a, as a uh, uh, early stages of a book, was going to be a kind of history plus theology. Very wisely, n a number of people told me that was a bad idea. <laughs> and so I broke it up into two. I am hopefully maybe still working on a theological follow-up to, to this book. But I came to realize, I, I, I'm a little bit ashamed that I came to realize this so late, how important telling the history was, in part because um, people had assumed the history was one story that it would it never change. You know, I, I don't mean to throw certain people under the bus, but there had been a dominant um, uh, idea in uh, the history of Mormon thought about gender here that church teachings had more or less never changed, you know, that you could go back to to DNC 132, and you could go to Talmadge's The Eternity of Sex in 1914 to the Proclamation on the Family, and it was one straight line, you know, or maybe you get some Pratt's in there or something like that. Uh, and I just became really dissatisfied with that as, uh, as a historical narrative and realizing that it wasn't just the theology, it was a sense of, uh, of a historical precedent, that there was no historical precedent for change. Um, that that idea needed to be dislodged. And so in part, the idea of telling the story as a powerful, uh, uh, as a powerful way of uh, kind of getting at this question, uh, for me, really uh, changed my mind about the importance of, of history here. And it was a huge learning curve. So thank you for your, uh, for your generous compliments about that. I had never written modern history before. This is literally the first book of piece of history I've ever published that's not in you know, the second century. So it was a total learning curve to deal with new sources, new ways of storytelling and so on. And so I'm just incredibly grateful that, it was, uh, that it's been successful and, and, and that people have, have uh, received it well. Um, but at the same time, the ethics around doing that to try to take that, um, that non-advocating voice, and some people might be disappointed by that, you know, uh, but, but that I tried to just tell the story as I saw it as a complicated way, as a set of conflicts between competing ideas. Um, I hope that that does enough that it didn't need the extra sort of push, the extra editorializing. The story itself was compelling and, and, uh, uh, compelling on its own. So at least, at least for me, I'm I'm grateful again that uh, that that's been uh, received well. Um, let's see. Uh, the question of hermeneutics. Yes, I think that 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 quote from Kimball of just saying I don't like the way that this sounds or the way the ways that which church leaders dealt with um, their the challenges to patriarchal norms and their attempts to accommodate them and appease them. Of course 
far sh falling far short of uh, many of the, the ideals that we might imagine for those, but their attempts to appease those showed a remarkable creativity. How do you get around, he shall rule over thee? <laughs> you know, that's about as straight a patriarchal text as you can imagine in Genesis 3.16. And they just say, man, we're, man, we're, not, we're just going to ignore that. We're going to change its meaning. We're going to... And um, the freedom that they felt to do that, I think, again, they didn't need a revelation for that. They didn't need, they, they just did it, right? They just said, we're going to ignore that text, or we're going to say it means something other than what it actually plainly says. And uh, I think that there's a lot of potential in that. Again, even coming from someone like Kimball, who was not a pro-feminist uh, church leader by any stretch, right? And so, uh, so I'm, I see some potential for hope in the kind of hermeneutical strategies that have been used in the past here uh, that we could continue to, to rely on. Um, and so among the various precedents that we can look to in history, I do think the ways that Latter-day Saints have interpreted scripture change and, and the, the, those changes. I'd also, I'd also point out that the way that Latter-day Saints understand the Eve story to be, we've always taught that Eve is the hero no, that's like in the 1980s is when we started teaching that, you know, um, feminists, LDS feminists were doing that in the 1970s. But when it becomes a mainstream doctrine in, in contemporary Mormonism, it's not until the 1980s, it's remarkably new. And, um, and uh, again, that's just become like, that's what we all teach. And that's what we've always taught. And I, I think that there's a, an important lesson in the ways that we approach those scriptural stories and completely can reread them in new contexts uh, as well. Um, okay, uh, 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 by erasure, the attention to science, Blair, these are really, really important issues. And I am, I'd love to talk with you more about them and unpack them a little bit more. Um, one on the question of scientific approaches. Um, in part, I, I admit that I just didn't do it, right? I, I am a humanist. I come at these from humanistic uh, a question, a set of humanistic presuppositions about things. I'm not trained as a, I'm not trained as a modern historian, but hey, I, I did that anyway, so maybe I should get training as a scientist. I'm not trained as a scientist. And so I tend to, to uh, take a kind of humanistic approach as opposed to a scientific approach to, uh, to, to, to questions of gender and sexuality. The um, discourses of science, the discourses of biology are hugely important. Not only have they, have they historically been in the anti-LGBT movement, but certainly in the pro-LGBT movements today. And you rightly acknowledge that um, not paying attention to those discourses and, the, and their, their importance, I think, does do some disservice to the ways that many of these communities have self-identified and continue to, to use that, that discourse. I would want to study it as, as the use of that discourse as opposed to just the sciences X, Y, and Z. But, uh, but I absolutely take your point that, um, that there are some real facts there that people need to grapple with and that challenge uh, 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 a set of presuppositions from whether a humanistic or a scientific perspective as well. I, I take your chastisement over by erasure uh, seriously. Um, at the same time, and this is something I'd love to ch chat with you more about, and maybe we'll have opportunities to do so more. Um, at the same time, part of what I'm trying to do with the notions of sexual fluidity is to buy, explode everything, <laughs> you know, in, in part, right? Um, I, I want to... I want to blur a lot of these boundaries or get, a, get out of some of these fixed boundaries and not to say that there shouldn't be, uh, again, the politics of identity around these things and, and the, the, those are important political categories that I want to acknowledge and uphold. But as areas of study, I, I'm interested in the, the blurriness of those boundaries. And I feel like in some ways bisexuality is precisely the thing that I'm most interested in uh, when I'm thinking about sexual fluidity and sexual uh, and sexual uh, and gender fluidity as well. So, um, so I should have probably made some acknowledgement to, to, to that or, or plugged it in a little bit more. And so that's a really useful uh, idea. And I would, uh, I'd add to that, that, um, in the same way that I try to call some attention to the absence of women in the discourses of homosexuality, I probably should have called some attention to the absence of bisexuality in LDS discourses of sexuality. Um, and that that's a reflection of the sources as much as it is sort of my own narrative choices in, in, in some ways. Um, 
while uh, uh, church leaders are, are deeply concerned with homosexuality, uh, uh, they don't seem to be concerned with bisexuality, in part exactly as you note, it's because bisexuality is the place where uh, the cure might be possible. It's an especially fruitful place for, uh, for change, for malleability. Um, and so bisexuality doesn't get problematized so much in, in the discourse. And that's something that I, I probably should have discussed uh, explicitly as a reflection of the sources, a reflection of the discourses that, that church leaders had. Um, but yeah, more absolutely more to say about that. So, so thank you so much. Um, those might be all of my uh, 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 notes that I got through. I'm and, glad I because I was just about to unmute myself and go, me off. Right. but I hate to cut you <laughs> off, but we have questions, but I actually want to start with you because we have so many um, great questions and everybody, please, um, of our presenters and panelists, um, if you have something to say about this or about any, I'm going to ask two questions to Taylor. And then we're going to go on and, and ask everybody some questions as we go through, if you, if you don't mind answering from your own perspectives as well. Um, why do you think that Mormonism's leaders uh, think that homosexuality is a male issue? And I know, because I've read your book, that you address this in the first section. But, um, but would you like to, for those that might not have read yet, um, I know it's. I not wish a it's actually a answer. harder question <laughs> than you'd think, right? Um, and maybe other people can can remind me of some things that I said about it. But I have I have a couple of suspicions. One is that it's men who are leading the church, and they are primarily concerned with um, with uh, male uh, ministries. And so to the extent that they're invested in issues of priesthood and priesthood leadership in missionaries at the time, um, these are the areas that they see that they are taking a special interest in because they're starting to perceive some vulnerabilities there, right? Um, and so, uh, uh, so I think that young men are perceived by the older men as having these problems that they need to, that they need to address and, and so on. So to the extent that men are invested in men, there's a sort of homosociality of Mormon priesthood culture that there's so, something to, to say about that. And I would add that perhaps we might even be seeing fewer LDS women confessing to church leaders uh, uh, on these issues as well. So it may just be showing up statistically less in their own personal interactions. And we might even just be seeing the sociology of the way that uh, LDS lesbians are not engaging in the hierarchy of the church and are more likely to maybe just leave. I don't know that for sure, right? It's a, it's a hypothesis and people would have to do some more studies on, on these kinds of things. This is those ethnographies that I wish that we had, right? But my suspicion is that it wasn't rising to, women's homosexuality wasn't rising to their attention for at least those three reasons and probably others as well. Awesome, thank you. It would also um, be because of the broader American cultural context, right? That also focused primarily on the homosexual male. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, and that that's that's exactly coming out of the uh, psychological literature as well. I think reflects those same biases uh, too. So that's an excellent, excellent observation. Thank you, Patrick. And well, one more tiny addition to that, um, I think we have very phallocentric ideas of what sex is too. To whereas two women having sex together is not seen as threatening because there's no phallus involved. It's literally like, oh, it's just two women getting together to cuddle. No harm in a cuddle, right? You know, it it, it it's it's real. <laughs> well, I was just about to say that in regards to the discussion of when church leaders tried to prohibit oral sex, and it's discussed very much from a, you know, oral sex is vaguely gay when a man is receiving oral sex. Um, and there, and, and that demonstrates a complete lack of attention to female sexuality and sexual experiences that women find pleasurable. You know, in LDS discourse, women don't have sexuality, they have reproduction. And there's also a lot less emphasis on, I think, female agency and more women as sites of male agency when it comes to things like courtship and sex. That's a very good point. Um, we discussed this one in advance. Um, we discussed discussing it. We didn't actually begin the discussion of this. But, um, but this question is, I was sealed to my ex-spouse 
who has now transitioned um, to be a woman, does that make our sealing void since we are both now both women or does the church not recognize her gender as female? And I think that very much comes into play with what we were just discussing about fluidity and whether or not we even accept that mm -hmm. and that gatekeeping that we were saying. Do, do we have any thoughts or comments on that? Well, on one hand, that's a, that's a, a question that can only really be addressed by the church itself you know is, is my is my ordinance valid i don't know that's that's what they will decide on 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 right uh, to put the question in, into an interesting um uh, historical or, or maybe even theological uh venue there i think that it raises exactly the issues that we uh, uh that that as a contemporary culture are dealing with right how are we going to deal with the reality of trans people, right? What does that mean in real physical material terms about how we are gonna do our rituals, how we're going to organize in classrooms, right? And the ways in which these, uh, uh, these particular bodies, these experiences, these lives um, disrupt a um, pre-critical gender essentialist notion here, uh, is something that we really have to wrestle with. And these are this, uh, this person's question is a real question that, that the church will need to grapple with, right? Um, and I don't, uh, again, that ultimately they'll be the ones who have to answer it, but, uh, but I, I think it's exactly the question that a lot of people are gonna be facing. Yeah. I think along with that, this next question, um, According to the Family Proclamation, gender is an essential characteristic of individual, pre-mortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. Um, how does the church reconcile intersex individuals? And I know Blair was discussing that a little bit earlier. It's a, it's a very fascinating thing, the things we don't have answers discussing about yet in the doctrine. Um, you want to go for it, Blair? Yeah, go for it. Sure. Um, so the easy answer is um, the church doesn't reconcile intersex issues. And it's literally a problem of total erasure from the conversation. And when it is brought to the attention of the conversation, it is now treated, as we have mentioned before, as a disability. I have literally had patriarchal leaders come to me and tell me, oh, God will fix you later. And I'm like, well, what if I don't want that fixed? What if I want something different fixed? What if, like part of the essence, the idea of a disability in and of itself is that I think of it as something that I would want to get rid of in the first place. So whether or not it's a disability, well, I get some say in that and whether or not it's a disability. And yeah, there are some things about my body. Like if, uh, you know, I meet my heavenly parents someday and they can like clear me up the way I want to be awesome i'm all for it like let's 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 do that but at the same time i'm not interested in like any kind of theological formation to where it's like you know what blair we're gonna fix you right up and we're gonna make you a cisgender heterosexual monogamous no thanks <laughs> that I, I would i would add exactly that the discourses of intersexual intersexuality and disability are deeply intertwined in the way that the church has addressed this issue when they have addressed this issue starting from the 1970s at least are my early um uh, uh, acknowledgments of, of LDS church leaders uh, discussing it at all, uh, where uh, intersex people are referred to as, quote, accidents of nature. Um, and so we, yeah, I think that we need to, to, to think about those discourses a little bit. I would also add that I'm a little bit embarrassed that I discovered this only recently, that there is an article in Dialogue. I'm also the editor of Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought. There's an editor, an, an article in Dialogue, I want to say in the early 1980s, raising this problem of intersex people and Mormon theology. And um, it's the only one that I'm aware of that exclusively, uh, or that, that, that addresses this issue. And so it's a conversation we've been having for over 30 years, really, uh, as an LDS intellectual community, at least. And just to call attention that, that it, as much as these are pressing issues today, they have been in our, in our past uh, uh, pressing issues as well. And so, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would recommend that article. It's, it's, it's an old one now for a lot of reasons, but uh, it's just interesting to note that we have been having these conversations. 
But this is this is where Mormon theology uh, becomes so much uh, richer and I would say more interesting than traditional Christian theologies because our heaven is so materialist, right? So we have to wrestle with these questions in a way that if you say there's no male or female and 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 you know heaven truly is sexless, genderless, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we we have to wrestle with it in in some really interesting ways, and we just haven't done that. Amen. I just wanted to add on to that too. Plug for Mormon theology and why it's so super cool is because it's material. Like we get to ask questions like, okay, if gender is eternal, do women go through menopause? Are we eternally bleeding? What is that like that? What is, what does it mean to be eternally stagnant, but have a menstrual cycle? Like it just, it's just mind blowing, mind blowing. Mormon theology is the best. Okay. Keep going. Thank you so much. All of you. Um, we have a couple more. Um, Taylor, are we are are you planning on an audiobook? You know, it's not up to me. I wish it were, and I get this question probably weekly at this point. Uh, a lot of big audiobook fans out there. Um, if you want one, I'll give you the email address to the editor at UNC, and and you can pressure them. Uh, I'm told that uh, maybe at the end of the year they would revisit it. Uh, you know, but yeah. It, it, I'm not sure how the industry works and what books get made into audiobooks and why and so on. But uh, I think with enough pressure, with an, with a, a, a call-in campaign or something like that, maybe it could happen. Sure. I, I only had clout at UNC with the last generation because one of my uncles was there. Not anymore. I, I have nothing. So we'll just have to start pressuring them and tell them that we want to hear you read it. Um, let's see, it, do we feel, I have, I have two more very briefly, and one of them is especially critical. Um, what potential is there for the future of Mormonism to be, to be gender inclusive and, or expansive um, beyond the binary? And then, um, and then our last, which I think we should close with because I, I really want everyone's perspective on that. <sighs> I don't know. The answer to the first question, I don't know. Um, certainly, I feel that I, I hope that I have made a case for how and why the church could change. Uh, others may make uh, uh, stronger arguments for why the church should change. Um, whether the church will, I, I don't know. Um, I think that the history that I've told up till this point and the history that I've seen and up to this point is one where accommodations to various social changes are made, often slowly, often behind the curve, um, sometimes perceptibly, sometimes imperceptibly. Uh, but that accommodation does happen. Um, at the same time, I am not a believer that, uh, that history goes in one direction. Uh, the 2016 election, more than anything, taught me that, right? We all thought the end of an era had happened with Obama. Uh, all good liberals thought the end of the, the past is over, and now it's all just, you know, rainbows and unicorns going forward. And it's not necessarily. And so depending on the particular personalities, depending on the broader cultural context, depending on the global history, that's one of the limitations of my book, I think is that it's an American history, right? Uh, but the, the global context and, and where things are going with the church around the world, those things all might shape the direction that the church goes in ways that I don't know that we can really predict. So um, uh, that's, my, that's my pessimistic side of, of the answer. I, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts about it too, but yeah. Um, our, our last question, which I would love to open up to the whole panel, is, um, is from a, a young person that's here. It says that I am a gay RM, a BYU grad, and a non-religious believer, and I'm not concerned about what the Mormon church thinks about LGBTQIA issues, because I don't think that they have knowledge or authority. My concern is dealing with believing family and my occasional visits to Utah where I am considered to be less than. Do I need to just avoid believing family and Utah? And um, I think the, you know, not the implied thing is, or is there another way? So how, how do people set up those boundaries and make sure that they're protected with those that they love? I'm the least 
person who should answer this question. So I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Blair, Jacqueline, and Alex maybe weigh in on, on this one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think one thing. Oh, go ahead, Jacqueline. Sorry. One area where tabernacles of light is helpful, where even you know, even though you may not really care about what Mormon general authorities think of their referendums on your identity, if your family does, it's very helpful in kind of complicating a lot of the certainty that we have. That like we've always taught this consistent thing and has always been very clear, and it's only in the last twenty or so years that things have gotten confusing for the church. You know. It does a very good job of disrupting that. And I think if you can disrupt some of that, um, it's always been simple and now you're a wrench in the works way of looking at things. People are more open to hearing your views. But I also think that um, there's a lot of value in maybe the approach that um, like Todd Christopherson's mom took where she was like, well, I may not know the answers to what happens in the next life, but I want to spend as much time in this life, life as I have with you and have a good relationship with you in the meantime. And kind of focusing uh, from that to saying, you know, maybe we'll never agree on Mormonism and what it teaches about my identity, but we can agree that, you know, we're family and we want to have a relationship. And for that relationship to happen, we need to have boundaries and we need to have respect and we need um, you to treat me like a person and to maybe, you know, this has been so difficult for me and that difficulty makes you uncomfortable, but I need you to sit with me in that difficulty instead of trying to fix it. Um, I want to add on, I guess this isn't really a Tabernacles of Clay answer, but it's the first thing that came to mind for me. Um, so I'm a lesbian. I've been out since I was 16. Um, and when I came out, my mom was whatever the opposite of accepting it is. Um, she was really upset. She thought I was confused. She thought I had been um, deluded or misled by people or so, I don't know what her thought process was. Um, that was when I was 16. I'm 30 now. My wife or my mom loves my wife. She's very accepting. She's a huge advocate in her ward. Um, I think, unfortunately, this isn't this isn't like a a happy answer. But I think the biggest thing has just been time. Um, and I've seen it with my wife's family too. So her family are really conservative Methodists. Um, you know, Methodism like Mormonism has kind of a, a spectrum, um, and they're very much on the conservative end. And they've gone from when we first started dating. Um, they didn't want to hear anything about me. Her mom specifically said, if you talk about your girlfriend, I will hang up on you. Um, and they just came from visiting us the other weekend and everything was great. Um, if you want an anonymous person, if you ever want to talk about this stuff, like look me up and email me or I'm on Twitter or things like that. Um, I'm super happy to talk to you about this. I've had a really long road, especially with my own mom and my believing family. Um, but again, time has changed a lot of things for me. Um, all, almost all of my family on my mom's side who are all very true blue, dyed in the wool, um, believing people were at my wedding, you know, which is not something I could have ever expected when I was 16. Um, so if you, again, this isn't a tabernacles of clay answer, sorry. Um, but if you want to talk or anything, again, you can Google me or find me on Twitter or anything like that. I'm happy to talk to you. I think that's exactly what we needed to close out. Do we have anyone that needs to make a final uh, thought or has any anything that they need to say to be closed? Then I want to thank you all for being here today. I think that this was a magnificent session, um, lots of wonderful information, great panel, and I appreciate all of your thoughts and I appreciate all of our attendees being here. And um, I am going to close out our session and have a wonderful afternoon and the rest of a great sunstone. Bye, y'all.